Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Scott Busby uh, from the US Department of State. And this uh, webinar is uh, Innovations in Open Government and Anti-Corruption in Taiwan. Very pleased uh, to have you all with us today. Uh, again, my name is Scott Busby and I'm the Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State from the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor uh, at the US Department of State. And I wanna thank everyone who is joining us from across the world and in different time zones. Indeed, uh, among the panelists, we have Minister Tang from Taiwan, Shreya Basu, who is currently in India, and Connie Abel, uh, who is currently in Germany. So we have, and us uh, here at the Department of State, who are here in Washington. So we truly have an international uh, cast for this uh, uh, webinar. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our uh, first uh, panelist will be Minister Audrey Tang, who is Taiwan's uh, digital minister. Uh, minister Tang is a leader on open governance efforts in Taiwan and globally. Um, minister Tang is tasked not only with making the island more transparent, but with finding new ways to use technology to engage citizens in the development and implementation of public policy. Our next panelist will be Shreya Basu from the Open Government Partnership, who is with us to discuss the Asia Pacific region and OGP's efforts to support transparency globally. And finally, we have Transparency International Senior Program Manager, Connie Abel, who will provide a global perspective on the role of innovation and open governance in anti-corruption efforts and discuss her work leading TI's contributions to the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, otherwise known as the GAC. Thank you all uh, for joining. Let me begin with a few opening uh, uh, comments. Uh, in the last year, people across the globe have been tested like never before confronted with a pandemic that knows no boundaries, faltering trust between citizens and their leaders, and social, economic, and political norms built around traditional in-person processes, many governments have imposed unduly severe pandemic-related measures that have curtailed open governments. These have included restrictions on civic space, government oversight, and access to information. Taiwan, however, has sought a different path. Buoyed by a strong relationship with civil society, deeply held democratic values, and a keen understanding of the benefits of technology to innovative policymaking, Taiwan took early bold steps to engage citizens while taking effective proactive steps to stem the spread of the virus. Although the global fight against the coronavirus is far from over, Taiwan already has many positive lessons to share with the global community. Taiwan's commitment to open governance goes much further than its public health response to the current pandemic. In January, Taiwan launched a wide ranging, independently developed national action plan and an open parliament action plan. These efforts were co-created with a wide range of civil society actors and reflect a deeply ingrained understanding of the ability of technology to remove obstacles to citizen engagement and to enhance responsiveness. Although Taiwan is not a member of the OGP, it continues to lead by example within the international community through the implementation of forward-leaning citizen-centered transparency reform. Taiwan is also a leader in supporting anti-corruption efforts on the global stage and recently committed to making a significant contribution to the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, which is an initiative to accelerate the impact of civil society-led anti-corruption interventions by bringing together investigative journalists and advocates. The United States is a co-founder of the GAC, and we are proud to partner with Taiwan in supporting it. Before we jump further into the substance of today's conversation, 
I would also like to take a moment to reaffirm the United States support for the Open Government Partnership, both at home and abroad. U.S. engagement with OGP is based on four fundamental beliefs. First, that corruption undermines democracy, sabotages development gains, hinders economic growth, and endangers human rights. Second, that transparency is crucial to the development and protection of effective and accountable governance systems. Third, that civic engagement and the feedback loop between government and citizen is central to the development of effective public policy. And fourth, that harnessing new and emerging technologies is critical to efforts to overcome the challenges we face in the 21st century. More than eight years after its founding, the US remains firmly committed to the OGP, both as an implementer domestically and in our support for partner country, countries seeking to advance open government. We are in the midst of implementing our fourth national action plan the first time we are implementing a national action plan across a political transition in our own country to make government information more open and accessible to American citizens, to foster increased innovation, advance scientific research, and strengthen accountability within the intelligence community. In addition to participating in OGP as a member country, the United States also provides the initiative with significant financial support, both to coordinate its global efforts and to sustain and strengthen country level commitments. For OGP to be successful, however, much more is necessary. For starters, OGP's success hinges on the ability of civil society to operate without hindrance and on strong public participation and engagement. Being an OGP member means promoting an environment in which civil society, including human rights NGOs and watchdogs, can carry out their work openly and independently. It means cultivating respect for freedom of assembly, association, and expression, both at home and abroad. In addition, the initiative's success depends on all of its stakeholders, government, civil society, and citizens, learning from one another regarding what works and what does not. In other words, the success of OGP depends on our openness to each other so that we might build on each other's efforts and work together to achieve our common goal of governments that are transparent, accountable, and which take advantage of new technologies to engage citizens and work on their behalf. Taiwan's promotion of transparency dur during the COVID-19 pandemic is a strong model for the rest of the world. Almost 10 years after its founding, OGP's track record is impressive. In countries across the globe, OGP has helped develop and implement reforms in anti-corruption, digital governance, civic space, and justice. It helps ensure that reformers consider the important but often neglected, ne neglected perspectives of women, youth, persons with disabilities, and the LGBTQI plus community. In the United States, we have leveraged OGP to implement meaningful reforms domestically, including to support whistleblower protections, create a professional career track for freedom of information specialists across our federal agencies, and address issues around police use of force through the Open Police Data Initiative. We also recognize that no country, no matter how big or small, is immune to democratic backsliding and that we must continually strive to deepen engagement with civil society, to institutionalize advances, and to address weaknesses wherever they appear. Over the next year and a half, the Biden-Harris administration will demonstrate our commitment to OGP and its underlying values through action. We look forward to working alongside a diverse and representational set of civil society actors to produce an ambitious yet feasible open government agenda, including as we look to co-creation of our fifth national action plan. 
we also look forward to working with South Korea as it hosts the next OGP Global Summit from December 13th through 17th of this year. The success of OGP hinges upon the ability of its members in, in the global community to learn from one another, to take into account best practices, and to benefit from each other's lessons learned. In that sense, we all have a lot to learn from our speakers' presentations today. Our first speaker, as I mentioned earlier, is Taiwanese Digital Minister Audrey Tang, a remarkable individual and a leader of the open government movement, both globally and at home. Minister Tang's countless contributions to the transparency community are perhaps best exemplified by their efforts to support Taiwan's fight to contain the coronavirus and the development of so-called mask maps that show citizens real-time stock updates of masks at different vendors. These maps have allowed citizens to more effectively target when and where to purchase face coverings. And in so doing, they have minimized in-person social interaction at a time when doing so has been critical for public health. More than 10 million people have used this app to date, showing how transparency and open data can save lives and impact communities in a very tangible and positive way. Perhaps just as notably, the idea for this effort did not come from just a government agency in Taiwan, but rather blossomed from Taiwan's close relationship with civil society and the technology community. It is a demonstration of the fact that leaders are more effective at innovating and ultimately serving their citizens when civic space is protected and fostered and when barriers to communication across sectors are minimized. And with that, I now turn the mic over to Minister Tang to discuss the role of innovation in Taiwan's open governance efforts in greater depth, including under the action plans published earlier this year. Minister Tang, over to you. Thank you. Um, good local time, everyone, since we're from very different time zones. Um, I'm very happy uh, to share with you some thoughts around open governance in Taiwan. And I would like to first say that while the mask rationing map uh, is well known, uh, especially in the US, but also in other countries, the same bunch of people, the same bunch of technologists from the civil society, GovZero and so on, have co-created a privacy preserving SMS check-in system for contact tracing uh, in the 48 hours uh, and we just rolled it out yesterday. So we will have another example to talk about uh, for crowdsource pandemic uh, prevention efforts, which, which so far has allowed us to counter the infodemic with no takedowns and also the pandemic so far with no lockdowns um, and with less than 20 deaths. Uh, and so the point I would like to make is that radical transparency is the beginning of civic participation. And uh, I would like to share some slides. Uh, do you see the slides? Okay, I, I hope so. Okay. Um, and so um, our national action plan is co-created as a standard uh, in the OGP format with the civil society in a multi-stakeholder uh, foreign fashion. The co-creation process went on for nearly one and a half year with 19 commitments. And I'll put some illustrative examples uh, that shows how those co-creational commitments are arrived at and comment also briefly on how it relates uh, to the counter pandemic and counter infodemic efforts. For example, uh, our entire NAP co-creation received commentaries on the join the GOV, the TW platform. Our national participation platform was more than 10 million people using it in a country of 23 million. And therefore we received a lot of very good proposals. One of the proposal, for example, uh, from the very beginning of the joint platform pertains to our tax filing system. Um, this person uh, named Zhuo Zhiyuan um, proposed on our e-petition system, and I quote, the tax filing experience is explosively hostile. Now that doesn't sound like a very actionable proposal, but actually what's uh, really at hand is that many people are now switching to use mobile phones 
and card readers are not that easy to access our citizens' digital certificate. So because we have engagement officers in each and every uh, ministry, we call them participation officers or POs, it means that these POs can engage this person and say, let's co-create our tax filing experience for the next year. And for 2017, the approval rate of the new revamped system was 96% because 5,000 or more of people contribute at least one post-it note to improve the digital service. And this system then, because it's contracted uh, through open API, became the same system that we use to ration the masks during the pandemic. So we don't have to build new systems. The cybersecurity audit and so on are very safe. And the norm and the people's familiarity with it because of the tax filing season is already there. So radical transparency, when people complain, we just invite them in saying, this is everyone's business, so it requires everyone's help. And so is the National Action Plan. We established the Open Government National Action Plan Task Force, and uh, we finalized the 19 commitments uh, with a lot of participants in the civil society. And um, the idea is that when we uh, convened this, usually uh, by OGP standards, there need to be one half government and one half civil society organization leader. So we have a joint convener from uh, Ministry of National Development Council, Gong Min Xin, and a joint convener, uh, Peng Ximin, from the Weather Risk Explore. And I'm somewhat in the middle because I say very publicly that I work with the government, not for the government. So I'm like in this midpoint between the civil society on one side and the government on the other side. And so I'm kind of this middle point convener. And this is um, not just symbolic. Uh, I would like to share my favorite quotes from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's inauguration speech in 2016, where she said, and I quote, before we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values, but from now on, we need to think about democracy as a conversation between many diverse values. That's to say, this is not a tug of war, rather this is a link that links the civil society and the government together. So this is literally my office uh, in the Social Innovation Lab. Uh, and every Wednesday, everybody can meet me for 40 minutes at a time. Uh, and we talk about pretty much anything, but the only requirement is that it needs to be published as a transcript or recording on uh, publicly available platforms, um, the OGP uh, supported Say It platform actually, uh, and then uh, for everybody to see in the future. It's very interesting because the nature of conversation changes. When lobbyists and so on go and have a conversation with me, when they know that there is a tape recorder, there is a video recorder that stands uh, as the watch of future generations, um, they always make the points um, the um, benefit of future generations of becoming good ancestors, um, you know, uh, global goals and, and, and all that. And nobody make the point that will benefit only them on the short term while sacrificing other people's benefits because they will look really bad on the transcript. And so because of that, we were able to get a co-creation going through radical transparency means. And the mission of the NAPMSF is, of course, the formulation, evaluation, and presenting the reports. And the uh, proposals, as you can see, is very balanced. Uh, and the member of task force can also add new commitment proposals and ratified by the community. I think the additional one is about environment sensing and around uh, especially climate action, because it become a new priority uh, since our original consultation. And so we can divide them into five major categories. First is about open data and freedom of information. And it strengthens digital privacy and personal data protection, building a better, what we call a social sector-based data collection uh, mechanism so that people first have the norms of, for example, sharing the mask availability on a publicly available map. And then through what we call reverse procurement, they would then demand the government to produce open API to make sure this map update in a timely fashion every 30 seconds, actually. So then that enabled the ecosystem of developer to put more than 100 tools that shows not just the availability of mask to reduce queuing, but also the long-term uh, trend to detect data bias and allow us to uh, ration the mask better last year. 
And so this social sector first approach is only possible because people understand there's a strong personal data protection when publishing the radically transparent data set. We also focus on involving young people. Actually, more than 100, um, 100 cases, uh, more than one quarter of all the past uh, petitions um, in the 100 collaborative meetings were started by people who are younger than 18 years old. That is to say, even before they are of the legal voting age, they can already propose something that change our public policy. For example, there was uh, someone with a pseudonym because we use SMS-based authentication, we allow pseudonyms. The pseudonym, uh, I love elephants and elephants love me, was the pseudonym, proposed that we gradually ban plastic straws for our national identity drink, the bubble tea, in takeouts. Um, and it went wildly popular. And then we met through collaborative meetings to discover she's just turned 17 and is a senior high school student, Wang Xuanru. And we ask, why, why are you proposing this? And she's like, well, it's our civics class assignment. Uh, our civics teacher just assigned, starting a popular petition that involves thousands of people um, as the civics class assignment. So again, lowering the threshold of participation led to this kind of collective intelligence and action. And in fact, Wang Xuanru, now 19 years old, is one member of our multi-stakeholder forum. She's part of our task force. So that shows our engagement to the young people who are previously excluded from the, the representative democracy process. We also promote gender inclusive dialogue and participation. Uh, Taiwan, as you know, is um, Asia's only jurisdiction to allow full uh, marriage equality, but it goes beyond that. There's also gender mainstreaming going on. My favorite example is actually from the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center. Every 2 p.m., um, they held a um, press conference where they answer all the questions. And we have this uh, 192 to a toll-free number that everyone can call and suggest new ideas. So last April, there was a young boy that called and said, well, you're rationing out mask, which is great. But all I got was pink ones. I'm a boy. I don't want to wear pink to class. All the boys in my class have navy blue medical grade masks. And the very next day, the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare suggested the CECC, everyone in the CECC, including the Minister Chen Shizhong, wore pink. And Minister Chen even said, Pink Panther was my childhood hero. So now the boy became the most hip boy because only he has the color that the heroes wear and the heroes hero wear, I guess. <laughs> and so this is a great example of gender mainstreaming, of setting the agenda, uh, saying that it doesn't matter which color uh, as long as it protects you. And it also promotes people's uh, inclusiveness when they just call 1922 with each and every issues they witness between um, the pandemic response strategy and what's actually going on in the ground. And we usually fix our policy <clears throat> within 24 hours because of the inclusive gender and ethnic group dialogue in multiple language. Uh, we have 20 national languages, including the Taiwanese sign language. And we also, of course, enhance integrated policies, enhancing political donation transparency. In one of the counter infodemic efforts, we classify social and political advertisement on social media platforms such as Facebook as equivalent to campaign donation. And interestingly, we did not achieve that with a new act, but rather with uh, civil society demanding Facebook doing so because they've already occupied the National Auditing Office uh, to liberate the data. And then they did the same to Facebook's uh, threatening social section if they don't publish the real-time social and political advertisement. And so for our presidential election season, uh, we see much less uh, political interference uh, by the campaigns uh, on the social media. So that's norms, again, set by the social sector is a great example of the people-public-private partnership. And so uh, in addition to the anti-money laundering, beneficial ownership, uh, and the financial transparency of religious groups to close AML loopholes, I would like to conclude uh, by saying we're really, really happy to see that our government decided, as Scott mentioned, to contribute uh, to 100K US dollars per year to support the GACC for this year and next year demonstrating our contribution commitments to participating in the global efforts of anti-corruption, transparency, and good governance. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for that illuminating presentation. I want to turn now to our next speaker, Shreya Basu. Uh, Shreya is the Deputy Director for Country Support 
at the Open Government Partnership and leads delivery, oversight, and team management for the OGP's work in the Asia Pacific and Eastern Partnership regions. Shreya is based in Singapore, but currently is in India. Uh, she is responsible for improving the services offered by OGP to governments and civil society in member countries and working across teams on the design and delivery of new strategic initiatives including within OGP's burgeoning work with local level municipalities. Before joining OGP, Shreya worked at Publish What You Fund, where she led the research and monitoring work stream, led the annual aid transparency index development, and successfully advocated for some of the world's largest donor agencies to make their aid transparent. In addition, Shreya has substantial experience within the private sector conducting fraud investigations and delivering fraud risk management and anti-corruption compliance programs. Shreya, as someone who has substantial global and regional experience, can you draw out some of the regional or global trends you see reflected in Taiwan's own vision and plans? Hey, um, thanks for the opportunity, Scott. So let me first start by congratulating Taiwanese civil society and the government for launching its first open government national action plan. You know, it's really great to see something that's been in discussions, uh, discussed along the sidelines of OGP summits and Gov Zero summits come alive and materialize into something concrete uh, with a vision for the future. So congratulations go to, uh, you know, Taiwanese civil society and government colleagues and of course to Minister Tang for her uh, personal leadership on this agenda. So the OGP support unit, we're just beginning to look at some of the trends we've seen in the latest round of a member countries action plans delivered in the 2022 period. Admittedly a smaller cohort than usual because of delays to OGP processes owing to the pandemic, but still I think broadly reflective of what we're seeing across the partnership for the last few years. So one, um, one trend is that uh, inclusion has really become an area that's come into focus in OGP, uh, both globally as well as in the region in recent years. And today, um, more OGP members are implementing commitments related to gender and inclusion than at any point since the partnership was launched. That's of course building from a small baseline, so there's a long way to go. Um, and it's really great therefore to see such a strong focus on inclusion in Taiwan's plan. Um, what personally strikes me as very interesting is uh, the many different dimensions of inclusion it focuses on, from youth to gender to indigenous peoples, ethnic linguistic groups, immigrants. Uh, a common challenge here for both Taiwan and for other OGP members lies, of course, in going beyond inviting traditionally left out groups into policy making processes uh, and tackling the harder piece and what it means to fundamentally shift power dynamics in these processes uh, so that the work that needs to be, uh, you know, the, the policies uh, that are made genuinely reflect the diversity of the societies that, you know, uh, we live in. So here there's an opportunity, of course, for, for Taiwan and other countries working in these areas to learn from each other's efforts and collectively advance the inclusion agenda with an open government further. A second sort of common trend theme, if you will, is of course that corruption remains a major concern globally, uh, certainly so in the region. Uh, Transparency International's, um, International's Global Corruption Barometer, for example, um, has, has shown that this continues to be a, a concern uh, and it has deepened the impact of the pandemic in the region. Um, so on anti-corruption, uh, we are seeing a growing number of countries take on important issues uh, like opening up procurement, one of the all time popular commitments in OGP, beneficial ownership, where we're seeing you know, 30 odd countries within the partnership now make commitments in the last two to three years. And we're really beginning to see a coalition of countries work together with partners to advance global norms around some of these topics. Um, and at the same time, we only have about a third of OGP members currently implementing commitments related to political integrity. Um, so we are heartened to see Taiwan's commitment on political donations transparency and hope it will allow others to follow suit. So here again, I think a, a plan that is reflective of some of the emerging trends, but also some of the needs clearly both in this region as well as globally in terms of areas that the open government agenda really needs to uh, you know, tackle front and center. Um, yet another trending theme, if you can you know, call, call it that in the partnership today, uh, one we are also seeing uptake of in this region, again, given the, the needs around this is justice. Uh, 
Um, so about 60% of the partnership today uh, is implementing commitments related to justice. And while we don't see this area directly reflected in Taiwan's open government plan, uh, I am aware of the work that's happening around transitional justice, for example, in the country. And these might be areas for future consideration. Um, so that big priority topics don't remain uh, you know, outside of the open government vision for the country. Um, a frontier theme, um, not quite as much a trend as we would like it to be, is of course digital governance, uh, where we're seeing a small but growing number of countries that are working together now to protect digital rights, tackling issues from regulating how digital platforms interact with democratic processes, to accountability of uh, automated decision-making systems, used in the public sector. So here again, it's great to see the emphasis on privacy and data protection alongside the commitments on open data and freedom of information in Taiwan's open government plan. But of course, Taiwan has much more to contribute than just these areas uh, and also learn from the you know, efforts other countries are making in addressing some of these other areas of digital governance, uh, use of AI, use of automated decision-making systems in, in the public domain. And clearly, uh, you know, stands in a good position to show the way forward for the rest of the region, uh, where we've seen uptake on digital governance issues, uh, again, not as high as we would like it to be. One troubling trend that we see globally uh, is that of declining civic space. Um, so creeping restrictions, Scott, that you mentioned in your intro introduction on civic space's ability to organize, assemble, protest, uh, are harming the ability of activists and journalists to hold governments accountable of ensuring that you know, information reaches people so that they in turn can hold their um, you know, governments and elected officials to account. Of course, Taiwan is the only country in the region considered to have an open civic space rating according to Civicus's monitor. But given the alarming declines that we've seen in places that we would a few years ago never have considered to have restricted space or the ways in which emergency powers have been invoked in restricting space during the pandemic, certainly in this part of the world, one thing to be one thing to, for Taiwan to consider as it looks forward is perhaps future proofing civic space. So for example, considering reforms that might ensure that any future restrictions on civil rights caused by crisis responses have appropriate legal basis protections and oversight. Uh, you know, so it doesn't just count on the momentum of reform and reformers to carry forward this the civic space and this dynamic that we see in Taiwan today, but really that this is something that can outlast political administrations, that can outlast um, the kinds of changes we see with political cycles. An area where I would love to see Taiwan buck the trend also is uh, perhaps the low uptake of commitments on strengthening public accountability and oversight mechanisms. You know, it's great that we see, um, you know, increasingly transparency commitments, both within the partnership and in the region, being complemented with participation opportunities for civil society and citizens at large. Uh, this wasn't true uh, always. Uh, but one area where we haven't seen as much uptake, um, and, you know, we would love to see Taiwan again, you know, set the pace for others, perhaps, is ensuring that there are ways in which um, there formal mechanisms can be created for citizens to be able to hold their public officials to account and that there are measures to ensure that you know there is an impunity when things don't work as they're intended to um, so while we are here discussing the executive yuan's efforts on open government today we are of course cognizant that the legislative yuan has also opened up uh, and has adopted the open parliament's agenda and so here we would love to see how that openness can be extended to include ways to strengthen how the public can exercise oversight on government functioning through their elected representatives, but also ensure that accountability mechanisms such as audit institutions, ombudsmen and other oversight bodies include formal mechanisms for citizen oversight and accountability. Um, so these are just, you know, it's, it's hard to summarize trends on open government in, in you know, globally as well as in the region. Um, that's a, a, a short tour, if you will. Uh, one, one reflection sort of, you know, taking a step back from all of it is, I think, repeating uh, perhaps what I said in the passing earlier, which is, you know, clearly Taiwan is enjoying a moment where you have reformers across government uh, working alongside reformers outside government, um, producing some really, uh, you know, fantastic innovations that can be shared with the rest of the global community, both in response to the pandemic, but even beyond. Um, but one troubling trend we certainly see in this region is how quickly reforms get undone. Um, so even as Taiwan begins the process of implementing this plan and the initiatives contained within it, uh, you know, we would urge you to look to the future and see how these, you know, how you can institutionalize these to outlive this moment, because ultimately that's where we've seen this agenda fail time and again 
uh, sadly, in many parts of this region. Um, and we, of course, would love to learn from Taiwan's experience uh, through that journey. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Shreya. Um, our last panelist is Connie Abel, a senior program manager for Transparency International and leader for TI on the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. Working from Berlin, uh, Connie has been instrumental in strengthening Transparency International's network of national chapters as regional coordinator and advisor for Eastern and Southeast Europe. From 2008 to 2017, she oversaw operations of the national chapters in 16 countries in Eastern and Southeast Europe, Turkey and Israel, supporting civil society development and engaging in national and regional advocacy work on anti-corruption and good governance. She has also worked in the communications and technology departments within TI. Connie, we are very excited about Taiwan's contribution to the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. Could you provide us with an update on that initiative and contextualize the importance of transparency efforts such as Taiwan's within the global fight against corruption? Of course, Scott, it will be my pleasure. Um, just maybe to start with a little bit of a warning. So uh, as you understood, we were moving a little bit away from the open government plan and, and uh, directly the initiatives that, that Taiwan has been taking under the open government initiative. But I think it still fits to talk about the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium here, uh, an initiative which is also equally innovative and which was launched at an uh, open government summit in 2018 at the time. And, and as you heard, we are very grateful. Um, Minister Tang, right, like Taiwan joined the group of countries that is supporting this initiative. So let me explain a little bit what is this all about, because the name doesn't really tell you anything, right? The Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. This is a cooperation between um, and investigative journalists and, and mainly the organized crime and corruption reporting project at this point in time and Transparency International on the civil society side. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, it doesn't might not sound so innovative to you in the beginning, but if you think about it, these are two very different groups. We might have the same, maybe similar aims and we go in the same direction and we aim to oversee uh, power in the society and so on, but it's actually two groups that, that move at very different pace, paces and, and had to find a way to, to first come together to, to leverage uh, each, each other's work uh, for more impact and for change, for positive change. So that, that's maybe one side. So what, what we are trying to do with this cooperation is uh, to see more impact from, from, investi from journalistic invest investigations uh, and to, to leverage them in a way that, that, um, that moves change at a, at a faster pace, um, that, that moves, uh, the anti-corruption world faster. Like, uh, so I, I wanna explain that a little bit um, but with an example maybe that that's best to be done. So um, one, uh, one campaign that the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium is running right now is called the Golden Visa Europe campaign. Um, and the, I don't know if who many, how many people have heard about golden visas and what it means. Uh, there are these um, investment citizenship uh, or investment residency programs um, and uh, there are definitely legitimate, uh, legitimate programs of this type uh, in, in many countries, but which, which allow for foreign investment and which allow for creation of employment. But there's also programs that actually just allow for citizens with enough money to come in and, and buy a new citizenship uh, by themselves. In, my, in some countries, it's only residency, but in some countries, it's really buying citizenship with all the rights that come with it. And there's a number of those programs running uh, in Europe now, um, while that sound maybe, sounds maybe interesting and um, you know intriguing, it also comes with a lot of risks. It comes with uh, corruption risks because um, maybe the people who have sufficient funds, and sometimes this is quite significant, be it a million or so to buy a citizenship, they might not have gained that money in the most legitimate way. <laughs> it might be, uh, you know, it might have come through corruption and, and they find a way uh, through these programs through a new citizenship to, to move the money, to move the illicit funds, to invest them in a different way. So it's quite a problematic thing. When we started this campaign in 2018, um, it, it was a time when, when hardly anybody, like when especially the European uh, institutions, didn't see it as, as their, um, their kettle of fish. I mean, they, they were not the ones supposed to take that on. This is a member state issue. And, and many people definitely didn't see, uh, most people didn't see the risks uh, to corruption and crime and also terrorism that come with those programs that are, that are brought into the countries. So um, just, just to say how it started, um, 
at the start of the, of the campaign, uh, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, they published about 10 stories from 10 different countries across Europe, how these, how these programs are running and what the risks are, like giving really concrete examples. We, um, we spoke in Brussels, we, we brought in, uh, brought in decision makers and increased the pressure and it, it didn't take very long actually so it, that the European Commission saw, saw itself uh, in a position where they had, to, they had to look at those programs, they had to study it, they, they announced the formal study which they were working on for almost a year and so this, this started and it started to change the, change the dialogue for us in a, uh, at a very speedy way. Like within a year, uh, the European institutions went from, well, we don't know if this is something we can even talk about, uh, risks, what kind of risks, to saying, okay, these programs are definitely uh, problematic. Uh, we have to regulate that, or we have to look at how to potentially regulate that. So it went within a year. So, so this has been going on since March, 2018. A little bit slowed down in the last uh, maybe year and a half year, like, you know, there was a working group and, and dealing with the issue. But then uh, what gave it another push was again, journalistic investigations. This time the Cyprus papers published by Al Jazeera, which came with, with a wealth, I mean, many of you might have seen it with a wealth of concrete examples of very questionable individuals using those programs uh, buying Cypri Cyp Cyprian citizenship, but not really being interested in Cyprus, right? But just getting into Europe, using the banking system in Europe and, and moving money around. So um, this again, gave it a huge push. And actually like, so in autumn last year, Cyprus uh, stopped its, uh, its golden visa program. And the EU finally, uh, the, the European Commission finally took action and is basically taking legal action against uh, Malta and Cyprus at this point in time. Uh, for their programs uh, to be stopped. So this is still running. I mean, these things take time, but just to say for an advocacy organization, like we're working on advocacy, two years, moving the discourse in this way is, is high speed. <laughs> for others, two years might sound long, but this is definitely high speed. Or maybe if I, I don't know if I have the time to give another example, but um, to, to maybe talk about like how, how this, uh, this kind of cooperation, just a, the, the, the interaction between these cases coming out, investigations really strongly making the push in the public and uh, advocates like us being there ready with potential solutions, with recommendations at the same time, how, how this can set the agenda actually. So maybe just to say in, in March, 2019, OCCRP published uh, the Troika Laundromat. I don't know if you're familiar with the word laundromat, but a laundromat is basically a system of how to, how to wash money or how to wash illicitly gained funds and, and invest them somewhere else or just take them out. And it's, it's through a lot of uh, offshore companies and, and you know, the different, different ways to disguise where this money came from so nobody can actually trace it back. So that's, that's a laundromat, there's a certain system. There's a number of them. You might've heard about the Russian laundromat, the Azerbaijani laundromat, many of them are also exposed by OCCRP. So when OCCRP came out with this, we had had time uh, to analyze the information that would be coming and to, uh, to look for like, okay, what would be a proper recommendation to counter that? And at the time, DI came out with the idea and said, okay, obviously uh, the issue is that national, national banks and oversight of those banks, like as usually central bank overseeing is not strong enough. It's not functioning, right? These, these kind of laundromats, they can, they can work and they can go on for years and nobody is stopping it. So what we need is, is uh, tougher banking supervision at the European level. I mean, in Europe, again, we have a different, we're in a different position than in the other parts of the world, right? Where we have sort of a super national uh, system of bodies. So that at the time, nobody besides a small other, other small think tank was talking about this idea and not to drag things out, but like now uh, about two years later, we know that, uh, and after a lot of, of, of course, after advocacy going on, we used a lot of cases coming out. The FinCEN files again uh, showed how this is, this, this is necessary, that there's a tougher oversight of, of bank and banks and supervision for those. Um, in July, the European Commission is going to suppose, uh, propose exactly such a body to be created. Again, within two years, something moved really fast. We couldn't have done that on our own at all. The journalists probably couldn't have done it on their own because somebody has to come with the idea and has to move and advocate it for. But this is, I think this is really the innovation of this program, how we function together and how, how we move for change. Maybe I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Connie, for that perspective and for your update on the consortium. 
We're now going to transition to the question and answer part of this panel. Uh, and I would ask that any participants who have questions or comments submit them in the chat and we will try to get to them uh, uh, if there is time. But I first want to pose a question to all of the panelists, and that is, are there themes or areas of work where OGP members and the international community could collaborate with or learn from Taiwan's experience? That's open to anyone. Maybe I'll say a, a couple of words, but um, I think the co-creation for our NAP is really a joint effort with the international open government community. Um, I personally attended quite a few OGP summits uh, and in the one summit because of passport issues, I couldn't par uh, personally participate. Uh, I send a telepresence uh, device. So basically um, the international community helped us uh, setting the tone of the NAP. And I think this collaboration because consultation for NAPs because it starts with national, I guess, um, is usually quite domestic and it's usually aligned with the internal bureaucracy, uh, the city governments in subnational or now the local level uh, and the national level and with their uh, kind of a little bit top-down agenda. But because of our strong link to the international community, pretty much all the civil society proposed um, commitments starts with some hand-holding or some comparative study uh, of, of saying, see, the RM said some other country did this really well. There is a strong sense that we should adapt that here or the right to know for the um, climate action, for example, example, the right to explanation for um, like uh, climate decisions that affects the future that came also from the international movement, uh, especially in the past couple years uh, around climate action and so on. So I, I think that there's a real chance here because our commitments are uh, more than two years. Uh, they're uh, three years and a half-ish um, and extends to the end of the Tsai Ing-wen's presidential term. So three years from now, uh, that means that uh, we do not actually suffer from this kind of mid prudential term uh, issue, and we align the co-creation process. So during the transition period to the next president, because Dr. Tsai is on her first term, so uh, second term right now. Uh, so the next president will be able during the transition term to again work with the international community to set the priority areas. And this is sounds like a trivial logistic thing, but in the international expert that we consulted, they all pointed out it as very important. So I might have, as well highlight it. Thank you, Audrey. Shreya uh, or Connie, do you have anything to say about uh, ways in which the international community could better collaborate with Taiwan or learn from Taiwan's experience? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think obviously the the one that comes to mind right now is just openness in the in the response to the the pandemic, and I think particularly over you know the this sort of current resurgence that Taiwan is seeing again. Uh, at this point in time, you know, how it maintains the openness that we saw in the first wave uh, and lessons that can be learned from, you know, Taiwan would certainly be, I think, welcome. Uh, I think there's an openness to hearing from all corners where there are good examples right now after the pandemic in a way that perhaps wasn't quite the case before the pandemic. So that might be, you know, silver linings. Um, I think also, you know, there are a, a number of open government themes that will ultimately depend upon uh, the international community working together because the nature of those, um, the nature of those issues are, are, are cross border, right? So beneficial ownership, for example, strikes as, as an example where, you know, it, it would make sense for as many countries as, and as few as they are right now to join hands in both shaping the global norms around this, but also helping advance them. Um, digital governance is another one. I think, you know, there isn't a standard set template on how you regulate misinformation, how you deal with uh, democratic controls over, you know, private companies. Uh, and, you know, what's the limit between, you know, privacy freedoms and, and, and the kinds of oversight mechanisms you want to see. So there are a lot of emerging areas that really um, sort of cut to the heart of the success of open government reforms, of anti-corruption reforms that are cross-border. Uh, or that really fundamentally threaten civic space and threaten uh, you know, the rights of people to participate in their democracies freely and without interference, which again require sort of collective thinking and cooperation, because again, these are not necessarily easy to regulate you know, in one jurisdiction at a time. Uh, so those are the obvious ones, but you know, across uh, 
across some of the other areas, open data, for example, Taiwan is a leader in the region. I'm sure there's a lot that countries in the Asia Pacific could learn from Taiwan in this area, um, as well as deliberative democracy, another area which isn't uh, sort of reflected in the plan quite squarely. I think it's mentioned in the youth commitments, um, but you know, we've seen, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting idea wherever we've you know, talked about it, but there's a bit of uh, hesitation and reluctance in getting very uh, divided, polarized societies to come together and, and try and create policies on the things that you know, concern us most. So here again, Taiwan has had some interesting experiments um, that, you know, of course, uh, OGP countries would benefit from, um, you know, learning about. But equally, I think, uh, you know, in, in, in countries like the UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, equally interesting work happening, uh, where there is obviously, as always, um, a benefit from, you know, the reformers working on, on these to learn from each other, regardless of, you know, how geopolitics might get in the way of the formalization of any such collaboration. Thanks, Shreya. Yeah, I mean, from my end, I cannot, I cannot really comment uh, on the implementation of the plan in Taiwan because that's simply not my area uh, of, of knowledge. But I mean, certainly sounds good, the cooperation with civil society. And what's, of course, very important for programs like the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium is the availability of data. So making data available, transparent, uh, being, being open there. So, so that, that's hyper important, right, to, to advance also the advocacy in the end. So yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Connie. Let me now direct a question to Minister Tang and to Shreya. Uh, developing the first uh, open government plan is one thing, uh, implementation is another. What challenges uh, should Taiwan and civil society be preparing for during the implementation period? What's the key to credible implementation? Audrey? Certainly. Um, as I mentioned, because uh, during the pandemic, most of the so-called GovTech actually has its blueprint set up in the civic tech community, especially GovZero. This creates a very different dynamic. Uh, it's almost like reverse procurement, where the social sector <laughs> sets the norm and the public sector implement the norm uh, that the citizens want. But I think for successful implementation to also work in other commitment areas, that's doesn't have as much public attention as the pandemic itself or the infodemic. These are like the two things on people's minds. Um, maybe I'll add climate emergency, but in addition to those three things, and because those three things are so structural international, they demand a lot of attention already. I think what's important is we make sure that the public service people working on the other areas, for example, indigenous engagement and so on, see this not as a extra form to be filled, a extra chore to do, a extra MSF, a extra meeting to hold, but rather something that can increase the quality of their conversation. I remember the Hakka uh, Council um, uh, delegate to the multi-stakeholder forum, a public servant said, uh, that's the first time to learn that it is possible to get the younger people to care about the Hakka culture in participatory way, because uh, after listening to other MSF in other commitments, uh, they discover if you make it fast, fair, and fun, then young people are willing to uh, voluntarily join and provide quality uh, improvements to policy making. And so I think engagement strategy that can be carried over to our um, other public service to reduce the risk, to save their time, and with success story we can point to from the counter pandemic and infodemic and climate mitigation uh, methods. That's uh, really key. Thanks, Audrey. Shreya, anything to say in response to that question? Yeah, a couple of things I think that we've learned from, you know, the last 10 years of OGP in terms of what, uh, you know, why commitments fail um, in, you know, between intention and, and, and implementation. Uh, one is, of course, if you look at, you know, the, the, the structure of Taiwan's open government plan or any OGP members plan, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a summary overview of what needs to happen in very big reform areas. And, and often the design of how you're gonna get from, you know, those words on two pages of paper to actually rolling out every aspect of the reform. Um, there isn't necessarily a robust process that is participatory, that involves the right stakeholders, that's regular and iterative, because obviously, you know, um, it's one thing to have a plan, it's another to meet the reality of implementation and course correct as you go along. So one would be to, to, to sort of, be mindful of this 
uh, tendency to think of planning as over and now implementation having begun. Uh, it's almost a continuous process of, you know, implement, plan, review, assess that needs to happen and not just something that happens at the end of, you know, a two or four year period of a plan. Uh, the other piece um, that we've often seen affects the implementation is the lack of interagency coordination. Um, so while you might have commitments around open data that might be owned by a specific line ministry, um, you know, adhering to the principles of what the, the, the reform of the commitment sets out to do does actually end up requiring all other line agencies to, um, you know, follow suit or, you know, to implement common standards or, or frameworks that are um, taken into account. So that's another one, so, you know, ensuring that there is that kind of interagency collaboration happening. We've seen that be a, a real challenge in, in a lot of countries. Um, I think, uh, you know, of, you know, Obviously, you know, I think it's needless to say that ensuring that these are rightly resourced, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, human uh, resources, but also the financial resources, um, you know, that's something that we've often seen uh, countries sometimes miss the mark on, not taking into account what this is going to cost and how is it going to be paid for. And then there's a sense of disappointment on why this hasn't happened on, on all sides. Um, so if the resourcing hasn't been considered across all commitments, that would be another thing to uh, you know, prepare for, uh, you know, so that implementation does not run into problems. And I think that my last and final piece is, um, you know, ensuring that this, this collaboration, which is at the, the, the heart of OGP, right? This isn't just about, um, governments that are willing to be open running the programs as they conceive them in, in their offices and, and I think that's a principle that you know as, as Mr. Tang mentioned is, is embodied in the way in which this plan was co-created but often we see the engagement drop off during implementation um, so all the momentum all the 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 I, I, I can't believe if I actually heard you right when you said you would receive 10 million proposals for the I don't know if I got that number wrong but that would be a, a, a record uh, you know, for any kind of uh, OGP, um, you know, an open government process. But, you know, if that engagement drops off, I think what we end up seeing is, you know, four years or two years down the line, when it comes to actually taking stock of what happens, uh, we realize that uh, the beneficiaries of programs were not included and therefore implementation failed, or that, you know, stakeholders that could have partnered with government in actually implementing a reform. So the need to have regular sustained in dialogue between government and civil society, which is not a one-off consultation, which is not just about civil society attending meetings, but a genuine openness to uh, to change course, to you know try new things. I think is is fundamental to implementation success. Um, and I think last but finally, um, and I think picking on on, on what Audrey said. Uh, sometimes uh, we get lost in in the rules and structures of plans and processes and forums. Um, and we get wedded to the idea of making sure we're compliant to them, whereas you know, ensuring that incentives are in place for the reformers that will need to drive these reforms uh, are also thought through in, in terms of implementation. I think I cannot underestimate or cannot sort of overemphasize the, the importance of that, the incentives for the lonely reformers that need to drive this uh, forward, uh, both within and outside government, um, so that you know, when the going gets tough, they know that there is, um, you know, it's, it's not gonna be a dark, dark tunnel you know ahead of them so i think the incentives for implementation would be important to think through as well thanks shreya we have a question to minister tang from rudu borman and the question is this taiwan's participatory architecture embraces digitalization very naturally also as a result of their own history and process even a revolution today many digital transformation processes are happening around the world what would be your recommendation to other digital responsables, uh, by that I understand that to be officials, who are developing their strategies without that open narrative at its core? Audrey? Certainly. Um, in Taiwan, um, our digitalization plan, our national plan, uh, is called DIGI, uh, for digitization, innovation, governance, and inclusion with inclusion as the <clears throat> kind of final pillar and digitization is just the beginning. Um, I, I joke about inclusion put the all in digitalization, right? It's digitization for all. Um, and so the, the point I want to make is that when we think about digitalization, it's not about smart cities, not about smart mayors. It's about smart citizens. It's not about the internet of things. 
is about the Internet of Beings. It's not about machine learning, but collaborative learning. It's not about user experience, but human experience. Not about virtual reality, but about shared reality. And, and these words, they are important because if we just keep saying um, open smart city, uh, right? Open internet of things, open whatever, uh, then it loses meaning, right? This is what open washing means. Uh, just prefix open on everything until it, it loses meaning and become a, a objective. Uh, I think what's really important is think about the system as empowering people closest to the pain, bringing technology to the people, not asking people to conform to technology. So start with inclusion and openness will follow. But if you start by prefixing open to everything, I'm not sure how inclusion could follow. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, we are now at the uh, closing uh, for our uh, panel, but I first wanna give each panelist a chance for brief concluding remarks. And let me uh, start with Connie. Any closing remarks, Connie? Oops, sorry, I learned I learned a lot about Taiwan uh, because my area. So thank you very much for that. Nice to meet you, uh, Minister Tang. And I was glad to to introduce the. the there's a lot more to the Global Anti Corruption uh, Consortium. Maybe just to mention, we also work on on the so-called legal accountability. So we are also looking at stories uh, or at cases within those stories and trying to animate uh, law enforcement and, and other authorities to to take up those cases and to deal with corruption. But maybe there's another opportunity to talk about that one other day. So yeah, thank you for having us part of this. Thank you, Connie. Shreya, any closing remarks? Yeah, just to say, you know, I wish Taiwanese civil society and government all the very best in the implementation of this plan. And know that, you know, there's a community of reformers, individuals, uh, like you said, Audrey, uh, you know, you tapped into for the co-creation phase. I'm sure we'll only be too happy to help in the implementation. And of course, as always, learn from Taiwan's experiences. So good luck and, and we look forward to supporting you. Audrey, any final remarks? Yeah, since this is about accountability, I would like to conclude with a, a short anecdote. Um, I say very publicly that Taiwan have universal broadband, universal healthcare, universal basic education on digital competence. And I qualify this by saying universal broadband means specifically anywhere in Taiwan, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second for unlimited data connection for 16 US dollars per month. And if you don't, it's my fault, like personally. Uh, and a couple of months ago, there's some guy in a quarantine place that write an email to me saying, I'm, I'm here to report human human right violation, because I uh, heard that you define broadband as a human right in these forms. But uh, it took me uh, four attempts and half a day to send this email, because on that Yangming Mountain side of the quarantine place, there is no broadband connection in any of the telecoms. And I'm like, OK, sorry, we'll fix that. And within just a couple of weeks, we set up a new telecom towers uh, providing broadband. Of course, by that time, he's already out of quarantine. But he made a point of actually driving back and measure with speed test. Uh, and post it on social media to hold me to account. So I think digital public infrastructure requires participatory accountability from the civil society. And that's my concluding anecdote. And I wish you live long and prosper. Thank you, Audrey, a, a great anecdote uh, with which to conclude. Well, thank you all for a very engaging conversation uh, today. And thank you to OGP for hosting today's event. I hope everyone who attended will continue to promote transparency and open in government wherever and whenever they can. Events like Open Government Week are a great opportunity to learn from each other, and I encourage everyone to continue to attend the remaining events offered by OGP. Uh, as a reminder, a recording of this live stream will be provided by OGP on its YouTube channel, so please share the link with those who are unable to join us today when it becomes available. This concludes our panel. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.